Hey, Todd, thanks uh, so much for joining me on the podcast again. Always great to be here, Chad. Thanks for having me back. Well, but myself and people that tune in value your wisdom and insights, and you're often requested to come back as a guest. So it's it's a great privilege to have you back on. And I've got a number of things to discuss as we roll into 2024 here. And I know that you're not big on making forecasts. I've read some of your stuff before that forecasts are often wrong and we're it's obvious that we're living in this very volatile time. So you're more keen on being prepared for all the different things that that can come. So with that little bit of context there, I guess I would love to get your thoughts on where we are right now as we went through this crazy four years uh, that 2020 to yeah. now where we're at three years, I suppose. Crazy three years, 2024 looks like it's going to be volatile as ever. Having come through that three years of of turmoil and volatility, where do you think we are right now as a as an economy? And I, I suppose you could frame that either Canada, U.S., North America, or even globally. Yeah, well, great question. And you're right. I'm I'm not really big on forecasting. I think maybe some of the the listeners or viewers of your podcast, you know, if they know my background, I've spent probably the last 30 years of my career um, trying to put together sensible forecasts. And I understand why we want to do this, but I've just kind of come to a stage in my career as an economist where I'm sitting here thinking, you know, is it really important to try to predict what's going to happen when we know we're going to get it wrong? Is it better maybe trying to expend some of that energy and effort and time, um, trying to prepare and helping clients or whoever listens to economists, helping them prepare for any number of things? So to your question, what does 2024 look like? Um, and you're right, it actually was four years, almost four years ago. It was March of 2020. Yeah. when the world really went uh, sideways. So we're, you know, sitting at almost four years. Now, of course, we know COVID is still with us, not in a pandemic. We're moving around, we're, you know, not using masks or not generally anyway. But the economy in 2024 is now, the global economy is now being affected by a lot of other factors. Uh, thank goodness COVID isn't the primary factor. But we got a lot of geopolitics going on, and this is really throwing the monkey wrench into what I think are going to be some economic forecasts that are going to have to be revised and revised again and revised again, because almost minute by minute, the geopolitics of the world in 2024 um, and I'm not, I, you know, full disclosure, I'm not a geopolitical expert and, and I'm not on, on your podcast to make predictions of what's going to happen in Ukraine or what's going to happen in Gaza or what's going to happen in Sudan. But all around the world, these geopolitical tensions, they are now having some economic impacts. Um, and one of the most obvious ones that we're seeing, even, you know, right now, so here we are in January 10, and we're seeing disruptions in the Suez Canal because of the military conflicts in Gaza. And again, I'm outside of my depth talking about, you know, the, the military um, maneuvering that's, that's taking place in the Suez Canal. But suffice to say, it is really disrupting some global trade. Um, I think I heard the statistic uh, this morning, 10% of all global trade um, takes place through the Suez Canal and 30% of oil exports and imports or transportation of oil, 30% through the Suez Canal. When you see that shipping lane disrupted because of geopolitics, then you can start to see, ah, this is how economics are affected by it. And it's not now just the Suez Canal, but the other side of the world, the Panama Canal, disrupted not because of geopolitics, but because of more extreme weather events. Um, they're fearing drought uh, taking place, which is making, the way I understand it, uh, making it more difficult for some of the bigger uh, freight carriers to get through the Panama Canal. So... Now that, you know, central banks are looking at, okay, inflation is coming back down, maybe interest rates can fall, but we might see this monkey wrench of disrupted trade flow in 2024, which could then, you know, the same way COVID disrupted um, supply chains, 
in 2020 and 2021, we could start to see geopolitics, more extreme weather events affecting trade flow in the same way. And it could create some delays of transportation, could create some shortages, and that could have an impact um, in the wrong direction on inflation, maybe pushing inflation a little bit higher, or at least preventing it from getting back down to where we'd like to see it. So 2024, and this is a long way of answering your question, uh, even though COVID is not the primary driver, there's a lot of disruptive things still taking place uh, this year that we need to uh, anticipate. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you elaborated on that because I, I did want to talk on both uh, the Panama and Suez, and, uh, and that's what I've understood as well as the Gatton Lake outside of Panama is what's responsible for raising and lowering the, the lock levels so those yeah. ships can navigate through, and that Gatton Lake, because of drought, is is at an all-time low or, or near record lows anyways. So it is causing these choke points and two major global trade routes uh, to be disrupted simultaneously, and as you mentioned, for completely different reasons. But that yeah. will have a major impact on just the global supply chain. It it I, I was going to save this question for a little bit later, but I think that's that's a natural segue for it. Is with this coming on the back of having supply chain issues through COVID, with China uh, having their zero uh, tolerance policy and closing down a lot of manufacturing, and that disrupted supply chains. And we all remember how everything got delayed as a result of of the pandemic, not just China, but Overall, everything was disrupted by it. And now we have an unrelated incident of geopolitical and drought that's affecting these choke points. Does that accelerate, in your mind, any movement towards more reshoring or onshoring or nearshoring, all the different buzz terms, which essentially yeah. just re relate to more goods being made locally? And that doesn't necessarily just mean North America. That could be Germany makes more of their stuff yeah. where uh, they produce where they where it actually gets used or Australia the, everybody almost becomes a little bit more inward focused as opposed to that global trade mentality that's persisted for decades now do you see that and that's a long question <laughs> I, I realize yeah. that's a long question to tee up but with all this in mind uh the last few years and these choke points now accelerating do you see more onshoring reshoring nearshoring I do see that. And I, th I think, you know, it all started to happen during COVID. So when COVID, you know, first dug its heels in uh, almost four years ago, you know, we saw this big drop in global trade and then it recovered actually quite quickly, but it's kind of leveled off. I don't think we have seen as much onshoring and friendshoring and reshoring as I think we are still going to see. Um, I think in some ways we've been a little bit surprised that global trade has held up as well as it has, given everything that's going on, you know, the geopolitics and everything else. But I do think we are going to see um, gradually more and more um, companies, supply chain managers, um, producers, manufacturers looking for more secure um, domestic supply, domestic or at least friendly ally countries where they can reduce some of that geopolitical risk. You know, and, and, and the big elephant in the room right now, of course, remains China. Um, relations between China and the rest of, um, you know, at least the Canada, US, Western Europe, um, those relationships remain quite strained. We depend so much on uh, exports from China for almost anything you can imagine. Um, in, in the manufacturing process. And, you know, right now it's it's questionable what uh, Xi Jinping is, is thinking of doing uh, in Taiwan. Uh, things seem to be moving in a, a, a troubling direction. Again, I'm outside of my depth talking about the geopolitics of China, but economically there's a lot at stake if we see countries like the United States having to impose even more sanctions. Um, they've already sanctioned some trade with China around uh, more sensitive military software and, and those kinds of technical things. But what happens if we see the uh, uni United States, uh, followed by Canada, having to um, you know, put sanctions on uh, exports from China of everyday household items? Um, that is going to have uh, an impact here in North America. 
Um, so I do think that we are going to see more of this onshoring. It might be gradual. It's hard to move these you know, supply chains in an instant, but I think more and more as we get into 2024, 25, um, unless the situation in China really takes a different direction, and I don't think anyone is predicting that, but I do expect to see a gradual but steady increase in this onshoring of domestic production. So there's two implications that I see in the industrial real estate sector as a result of that. And, uh, first would be on the manufacturing side. If more things just need to be produced in North America, that results in a lot more factory or plant space that's going to be required. And I think that there are areas with it. Like Alberta is a good place. We've got a lot of manufacturing infrastructure, the rust belt in the U S there's a lot of manufacturing infrastructure. There's a lot of labor there that's underutilized. So there are pockets in North America where manufacturing could get established. But I think we will see a lot more manufacturing space required. Is that something that you think is also a gradual thing? Like, because we, we have seen a lot of development going up, like there's multi-billion dollar industrial projects happening all over North America to facilitate this manufacturing yeah. growth. Do you see that trend coming and, and I'll, I'll get your thoughts on that before I look at the other side of the industrial space. For sure in the United States, and a lot of that is being spurred by their um, Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. Um, it seems like inflation is the last thing that's actually being affected by the IRA, but there is, you know, billions and billions of dollars in the United States going towards, you know, the CHIPS Act, which is just one example, but even things like solar panels and things like, um, you know, the, 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 the infrastructure and hardware around greening the economy. That is really stimulating a lot of industrial space activity, you know, giant, um, um, manufacturing parks and industrial parks are are being uh, built uh, because of the billions and billions of government dollars that are being poured into it. In Canada, we haven't seen it as much because we our governments haven't followed the same sort of really aggressive spending that we've seen in the United States. But we don't know uh, what's going to happen in, in the United States, as everyone is uh very aware it's it's an election year uh what happens after november and then whoever ends up in the white house in january a year from now um it boggles the mind actually when we think about all of the different ways this could go and whoever ends up in the white house what does that mean for the future of the ira the inflation reduction act uh, does it get scrapped um, i think that is improbable simply because um the train is in motion, you know, the, the, the momentum of it. But it could get dramatically curtailed. Um, if Mr. Biden wins re-election, we might see, you know, a continuation of it. Um, but sort of as a side story to that, uh, what happens to the United States and their credit rating when we see this massive amount of borrowed money being spent? At a time, in fact, when the U.S. economy should be running surpluses, Traditionally, their economy is in fantastic shape. They've got three and a half percent unemployment. Um, you know, this should be the time when, in fact, government uh, spending reaches surplus levels and then you deficit spend during a recession. Right now, we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing the, the U.S. government um, for all kinds of different reasons related to, you know, the climate change uh, initiatives. And, but we're seeing the U.S. government plowing billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars um, uh, at a time, in fact, when the U.S. economy is, is doing well. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. It's a long way of saying I do think we will see that industrial spending continue in the U.S., even if uh, Mr. Biden is not successful in his uh, re-election bid. Um, in Canada, a little more complicated because we're not we're still a, a more than a year away from an election here in Canada. But um, there just doesn't seem to be the same amount of immediacy around government support for more industrial spending. I think we will see it pick up here in Canada, not to the same degree as we're seeing in the U.S. 
a great answer. And and what I really appreciate about that is it speaks to how complex the entire system is and why it's so difficult to make a forecast is you have yeah. all these factors that you have to account for. And if any one of those changes and the election's a perfect example, and this is why in my experience, having gone through, I guess, four uh, in my working career, going through four U.S. elections, it always seems to pause the economy and people making decisions. It always seems to pause right before for those exact reasons. If you're thinking of opening up a big manufacturing plant right now, it would probably make sense to see what government support you have from the highest level down. So to wait an extra couple months until there's certainty on that election might just be a wise decision. And it, it just emphasizes why it's so difficult to make a, a, a prediction on this. It's the uh, the the other side of the coin on the industrial front is that that's that would the manufacturing kind of speaks to the heavy industrial side of it the manufacturing but there's also the light or cleaner industrial side which is warehousing which has been propelled by e-commerce uh, which has driven a large portion of the, the large distribution centers that we've seen pop up all over the world and there's perhaps no better indication of that than being in these large port markets so. Uh, uh, Inland Empire, LA, Vancouver, New York, as main ones there, uh, as main port markets. If there is a, a transition towards onshore and reshore, and so these, these are still interconnected, do you see that these markets have a little bit of a pullback if there's less things being imported and perhaps even less things being exported because it's being used or consumed where it's made. Do you see the port markets being affected by this or will this be such a gradual change that the market just has time to adapt to it? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it sort of comes down to, I don't think global trade, um, you know, is, is ending, but it's reorganizing itself. So again, we might see maybe less trade with countries like China, and maybe more trade um, with countries like Japan or Australia. Um, those countries that were a little more certain are going to remain allies and reducing some of that geopolitical risk. So um, it might just be a reorganizing or a shifting of where we are trading from. Yeah, more domestic, um, but also more um, trade with those countries that were, were certain to be allies. So I, I don't know, even though I do think we are seeing more onshoring, more friendshoring, I don't know if it means um, a precipitous drop in uh, global port activity, say a port like Vancouver. It might just mean we're getting it from different places and we're selling it to different partners. Yeah, that will be really interesting to see how it unfolds because they, they're, they're linked. The manufacturing and the warehousing side they're they're linked for that reason is that you manufacture something and where it's going to be used all of a sudden that means that you don't need to have that made in another country and imported or conversely even exported right. uh, but it's it, I, I i don't see china necessarily imploding uh, as uh, peter zihan is a geopolitical strategist that, that i follow and he's got the opinion that china's dying. If, if not, he's probably already written the obituary for it. And I don't go nearly that oh. far. I mean, China has built up a very impressive factory system uh, over decades. I don't see that just drying up overnight. So it, it will be really interesting to see. On the industrial space, Do you where, where do you place that right now in terms of not necessarily its contribution to the economy, but perhaps its role in the economy, uh, because there, and, and I'd just love to get your thoughts on this because that the vacancy rate has been ticking up. There is a lot of new inventory added over the last couple of years, most of it to satiate this new demand for growing distribution space, but the vacancy rate has been ticking up. There does seem to be pressure on the economy as a whole with, as a result of interest rates, but what's, what's your thoughts on the industrial market as a whole right now? Well, I guess all of the, you know, that question and many other questions right now, it sort of comes back down to our are we going to uh, be able to orchestrate the soft landing, the, the unicorn of economic <laughs> outcomes, where by jacking up interest rates, the central banks 
you know, Bank of Canada, U.S. Federal Reserve, they're able to bring the economy back um, back down to ground without pushing us into recession. Um, six or eight months ago, I would have been more solidly in that camp saying, no, a recession at this point is more or less inevitable, which would then have that, you know, even worse impact for industrial activity and industrial vacancy rates. But now, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of, despite everything going on, um, you know, the geopolitics and crazy weather and all these, these negative things, it does appear more and more probable that we're going to orchestrate this soft landing, that we're going to avoid at least, um, if not an outright recession, we'll at least avoid sort of a major recession. Like it might dip modestly below zero, but... But at this point, it doesn't look like, you know, a major kind of pullback or contraction in the economy is in the cards. It looks like, you know, if it's more luck or skill, but it does look like these central banks have been able to uh, pull it off. They've they've been able to bring the economy back, um, lower inflation. We're not all the way there yet. Um, the unemployment rate has ticked up, but it hasn't skyrocketed. So again, a long way of answering the question, if we're able to orchestrate that soft landing, I think that's on balance, you know, positive for industrial activity and industrial space. But like everything, we have to stay tuned because we're um, only halfway through the novel so far. Yeah, that's a good way of describing it. So we're roughly a year into interest rates having risen at the fastest pace in four decades, I believe I read. What happens if interest rates don't come down? And there's the feds in the US came out and said uh, at their recent meeting that they might anticipate three interest rate cuts this year, and then they walk that back right after. What happens if they aren't in a position to lower interest rates for any number of reasons? What, what happens in 2024? Yeah, that's also a good question because I think there, you know, sort of is an expectation that interest rates are going to come down. And if that doesn't happen, uh, where does that leave industry? Where does that leave, you know, mortgage holders or, you know, people who are hanging on to renewing their mortgage, anticipating um, that rates are going to come down? If they don't come down, I guess the obvious impact is, you know, the economy um, maybe does push a little closer towards a recession. Um, but I think, it, you know, the other kind of sideshow here, um, unrelated to, you know, the performance of the economy is, do we start to, you know, lose some confidence in central banks and this forward guidance that they're giving us? Um, do people then start to question uh, the legitimacy or, you know, how reliable are, are these central banks in, in what they're telling us? We've all been expecting interest rate cuts. If they don't come, are the central banks going to be able to, you know, sort of credibly explain why they're not coming down? And maybe they can. Um, if we don't, I think all along they've been pretty clear. If we do not see inflation come back solidly to the target, you know, 2%, um, rates are going to, to remain where they're at. There is an expectation that inflation is going to continue to ease up. That expectation is fueling the expectations that central banks are going to, you know, eventually um, start to lower rates. But if it doesn't happen, how convincing will the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve be? Um, and, and, and does it just sort of create some pessimism and cynicism among uh, market players and borrowers? It's something that I've been struggling, squaring the circle in my mind is that interest rates are almost inflationary in themselves if you look at it yeah. through the lens of just the housing industry. So as interest rates go up, it makes housing more affordable. It makes uh, the co borrowing costs for investors that own rent the rental pool more expensive. So it really does have that upward pressure on housing, which is a major contributor to the inflationary index. So by increase in interest rates, they put upward pressure on the housing market and housing costs. If they, and now we're actually in this situation, Canada is, is one of the biggest uh, uh, people, uh, biggest countries right now uh, bringing in immigration. The U.S. is bringing in a lot of people. So now you have this situation where there's so many more people coming in, but it's been expensive to develop new properties. So the, the, the development pipeline has actually slowed down. 
uh, and then you're, you're adding in new people. Yeah. So you almost have more people scrambling for more, for more property in a limited supply. So that's why I think in some cases, industrial is a good example. Industrial sales have gone down, but there has been an uptick in interest rates. We're seeing in some markets, apartment rental prices going up. Uh, how, how do they, yeah. how do they square this circle of having these, this dichotomy of interest rates are causing upward pressure on, on inflation indirectly or directly. I, that's above my pay grade to answer but it is having some pressure on it. And then we also have all these other peop new people coming in. Uh, Alberta is a good example. I heard there's 195,000 new people that came in. So how, yeah. how, how does this, how does the whole system work cohesively to balance inflation not getting out of control, but also keeping those interest rates at a level where you're trying to control something that is, <laughs> that is the same lever? <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it's a fantastic question. And I guess there's sort of two things to unpack in there. The first one is, you know, is our higher interest rates themselves inflationary? And without question, because there is that that piece of the consumer price index called, you know, a mortgage or, you know, um, having to do with harm, uh, borrowing affordability. So interest rate increases are directly and indirectly going to also be inflationary. It's it's one of the, sort of the paradoxes or the conundrums that I know uh, our friends at the Bank of Canada are acutely aware of. Um, it's not, of course, the only thing that drives inflation, but rising interest rates is going to, to some degree, um, sort of exacerbate that inflation problem. But then the other bigger question I think that you've touched on is, you know, the whole housing crisis situation in Canada. And I do think that this is going to be the defining economic story of 2024 and likely the, probably the biggest um, um, election issue in 2025 is the housing crisis um, because we have two sort of competing things. We've got um, an immigration policy um, that is um, welcoming more uh, Canadians. Um, and on balance, I do think that is the right thing to do um, for our economy, for our society. We're an, an economy that has been built on, on immigration. And uh, on balance, I, I'm in favor of, of increasing immigrants. However, we have to house everyone somewhere. And this is now the big dilemma that everyone um, is, is acutely aware of. And it's made worse because, you know, at, to some degree, all three levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal, they've all got skin in this game. And up until now, I haven't seen much other than a lot of sort of passing the buck. One government sort of blaming another level of government saying, well, until they do this, we can't do this. And, you know, and I, and I get there are, are all kinds of hurdles and barriers. But what I'm hoping is that in 2024, we're able to, we're not going to be able to just snap our fingers and solve the problem. Um, housing is one of those things that if you're going to increase the supply, um, it doesn't happen in a day or a week. It happens over several months and even years. Um, I think there's there's some really positive developments. Calgary was just uh, named as, as a, an interesting city to watch in terms of the conversions of some outdated office space. We've got a surplus of office space, converting that to some residential property. I think that idea uh, and the success that we're seeing here in Calgary, uh, I think we will start to see other cities mimic that. That's only one piece of the solution. We need lots of other solutions. Uh, we might need some maybe government incentives, direct incentives or direct um, uh, rebates, perhaps, um, to homeowners to say, you know, if you've got a spare bedroom, you've got a basement suite um, that you haven't rented out, maybe to a student, uh, to an individual. I know not every home is going to be able to do that. But I think if you dangled enough carrots in front of, say, a lot of empty nester uh, Canadians who, uh, you know, their kids have moved out or Hopefully they're going to move out soon, but you know they, they might have some space. Could that be another part of the solution to maybe house a, a, a student who needs housing for the school year? I think there's lots of ways uh, that we can. Um, no one way is going to be the silver bullet that solves the whole problem. 
But I do think that in 2024, we've got to get creative in Canada because uh, as we all know, this is not a country where, for one thing, you don't want people living in tents and living on the streets. I, I think it's an atrocity that a country as wealthy as Canada, that we have this problem at all. But we certainly cannot tolerate watching the homelessness situation become worse. Worse. Um, and it's not because of, you know, any fault of their own other than that there is nowhere to live. Um, Canada cannot allow itself to uh, be put in that spot. It would be an embarrassment, I think, and a, and a real um, shame for our, our country to end up that, that way. So I think we got a lot of work to do in 2024 and 2025 to, uh, to avoid that worst case scenario. So there's a lot going on right now and as as i think we both agreed i think people listening would agree as well it's virtually impossible to make any predictions about the future so with with that in mind though i'd love to get your thoughts on things that you're excited about right now what will you think are positives going into this future and then also things that you'd be concerned about potential red flags warning signs, things that if they do happen, they could perhaps be a sign of worse things to come. And we'll start with that because I'd rather end on something positive. Uh, but what, sure. what are some of the things that you'd be concerned about right now that people should be paying attention to? Yeah, well, I mean, sort of getting back to what we were talking about earlier, I, I my biggest concern for 2024 is the geopolitics. And I don't know if that's just because I, I watch too much news, I should probably just turn it all off. But economically, this, this could have some really serious implications. And what I've been urging clients and, and groups that I talk to, industries I talk to, is, you know, do you have some contingency if you find your supply chain of whatever it is you need, or your customers need, because sometimes I have industries say, well, we don't actually import anything. We're an insurance company or we're, you know, the you know, financial institution, but your clients might be affected by that. Do you have, have you put some thought into what is the plan B if we see global supply chains um, seizing up very suddenly? It's not my prediction that is going to happen, but it is a possibility that we will see supply chain disruptions once again. We're already starting to see it. So, you know, that I, I am a bit pessimistic about. I do think that 2024 is going to, um, it's probably going to be one of those years that uh, takes up a whole chapter of a social studies textbook in 30 years, because I do think the global geopolitical map is being realigned. And, and I, do, I do think we need to be concerned about it. We can't do anything about it, but we can prepare our industries and our companies. The other thing that I have some uh, worry and pessimism about, um, but there's, there's things we can do, is around climate change and the more severe weather that we're seeing. I know climate change is an explosive and divisive topic for many Canadians, especially those involved in the traditional energy sector. And, you know, I always like to avoid getting involved in the debate about, you know, what exactly needs to be done. I know there are, there's a divisive debate about, you know, Ottawa versus the provinces and, and all the different, you know, political ways that you can address climate change. So I avoid that. However, I do think we need to understand that climate change is real. More extreme weather is real and it is happening in real time. We do not need to sort of think about 2035 or 2050. It's happening already. So here where, where I live in Alberta, and I know your listeners are are uh, all over the place, but you know, here in Alberta, we saw a record year for forest fires last year. Uh, depending on snowfall this winter, and it's not looking good at the moment, uh, the summer of 2024 could be even more uh, severely impacted by drought, uh, which not only affects uh, our, our agricultural producers, but of course could produce more forest fire. This also has an economic impact. Um, tourism you know, is no fan of forest fires. Uh, no one wants to be out camping when you can't breathe the air. Um, U.S. visitors don't want to come up to Canada uh, if there is fire or, you know, even threat of it. So uh, more extreme weather events, you know, agriculture can be affected, but everyone's affected because of higher insurance premiums. 
So we've seen in 2022, I don't, I haven't seen the final numbers yet for 2023, but 2022 was a record year for insurance claims in Canada due to natural disasters. And I do expect um, if 2023, 2024, uh, I don't foresee that trend reversing itself. All of this means that insurance premiums for everyone are likely to remain high and maybe even increasing. How do you prepare for that? Well, I guess we can't maybe do anything about it, but businesses, companies, I think have to be aware that um, budgeting for insurance is probably something that now it cuts into profits. It might have to, you know, result in reduced spending elsewhere, but higher insurance premiums, we need to prepare for that. So those are two things, the geopolitics, the extreme weather, that I I have to confess, I, I feel pessimistic about, but my optimism, my hope remains around, there are, are there are ways we can prepare for these things that if they do hit us, they don't need to be devastating. Yeah, that's what I really enjoy about your perspective is that it's, you're not, necessarily proclaiming that any of this stuff necessarily is is inevitable but there are concerns about and there are instances of some of this already happening as you mentioned as well and i think just yeah. being prepared is is the best thing you can do that's just being a responsible business owner or homeowner or just citizen is being prepared for these situations and and i i see that insurance being a big problem uh in in the us as well especially in, in areas like florida uh, I've, heard, I've heard texas is is really bad right yeah. now where they're seeing California you can't even increase. get insurance yeah like that what a problem that would be is, is you buy a property and you find find out you can't get insurance or your the yeah. insurance company just lets you know that you can't be insured like that's I, I can't even imagine having the 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 responsibility of having to self-insure something like that where that, that might be a business decision for some people but that's not everybody's in a position where they can even do that so you have a property that's uh, not insured and then there's another natural disaster and it wipes you out completely like that's yeah. that's not having insurance is much worse than having to pay too high of insurance right yeah and and i'm speaking on something that i'm not intimately aware of but california uh, for example, you know, it's a, it's a great example of when governments try to do the right thing by putting a cap on the price of something to protect consumers. So there is an absolute cap on how high insurance premiums can go in California, all well intended to protect uh, consumers, businesses from paying, you know, extortionary levels of inflation or of, of insurance. So they put a cap on it, but uh, on the price. But when what ends up happening is that insurance companies are just saying, well, guess what? We're just not going to take any more uh, policies in California, leaving a lot of homeowners and businesses potentially uh, unable to get uh, property insurance at all. That's an even worse situation than having premiums that are, you know, are rising too high. Yeah, insurance is going to be a, a big topic in, in this year. I, and, I, and I don't see that so, easing up anytime soon. Yeah. What what are some of the things that you're excited about for 2024? Excited about, and I am excited about a lot of things. One of the things, and I know it's gotten a lot of attention, both positive and negative, but I am excited about the prospects around artificial intelligence and just more generally uh, some of the technology that we are seeing, um, quantum computing maybe being one of them. I sat through a session just before Christmas on quantum computing, um, basically super powerful computers that are able to do things that we've never imagined, uh, the power, because they're doing it now at a molecular level. Don't ask me to explain it, but it, you know, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, well, there is a lot of worry and concern and anxiety. A lot of it may be fueled by Hollywood movies, but I think some of it also based in some, some reality. I think the potential for some of these technological breakthroughs, um, these advances, I think, you know, I, I tend to view more the uh, glass half full on some of these some of the um, maybe environmental problems, medical problems that we're trying to solve. Um, you know, could artificial intelligence um, sort of free up humans from doing a lot of work? Now, some people might say, well, this is just going to cause unemployment. 
And I think it will create some displacement of jobs. And it's no longer just the low paid service sector jobs that are getting replaced by robots. It is now potentially higher income, higher trained, higher educated uh, people like lawyers and accountants and maybe economists uh, who, who might find themselves a bit displaced because artificial intelligence uh, is now able to do a lot of the tasks that previously we did. But I still think that, you know, the, the, the human in, uh, ingenuity and human the human spirit, uh, I think we'll find ways to work with artificial intelligence. Um, it might mean the displacement of some skilled individuals, but I think what humans are really good at doing is adapting to those changing circumstances. Um, I know it's not entirely comparable, but I'll use the example of going back to the 1970s and 1980s where uh, bank machines, uh, ATMs started to show up. And this was predicted to wipe out employment in the banking industry because no one is going to need to go and see a teller to have the money counted out for them anymore. And there was a lot of concern and anxiety about that. But in fact, the opposite happened. It freed up a lot of those tellers um, from doing sort of menial things like counting out dollar bills to doing more productive things like working with clients and, uh, you know, around uh, investment uh, opportunities or, you know, advice on banking. So today we see just as many people employed in banks as we ever had, but they're doing less menial things things, we hope, than what they were doing in the 50s and 60s. So I think, with you know, the promise of artificial intelligence in 2024, for sure, there are things that we need to put some safeguards around it. Absolutely. But I, I tend to be more excited about uh, the potential, uh, the opportunities that this could have in, in boosting productivity, maybe freeing up humans from doing some real drudgery work. But um, a great quote I heard from, uh, from a friend of mine, Patrick Lohr, he said, your job, you're not going to lose your job because of AI. You're going to lose your job to somebody who uses AI. And I think that is the way we need to think about it. We need to use AI as a tool and put some safeguards in place. But I'm optimistic about AI, uh, quantum computing, and a lot of the other really interesting technological things taking place. Yeah, it seems like we're just on the cusp of it because it, it was less than two years ago where nobody even heard the word chat GPT. And yeah. now that's one of the most popular things that we hear all the time in a very short period yeah. of time. Yeah. And how do you use it? And I know a lot of people are trying to wrap their head around how does chat GPT work and how does AI work? It's sort of like, and you're, you're probably too young to remember, I remember 1992 when this thing called the World Wide Web showed up and we were all trying to figure out how does it work? <laughs> but after you sort of drop that question and it's like, how do I use this? Well, then that it opens it up for all kinds of possibilities. And I think chat GPT and AI more generally, you know, hopefully follows this, this, the same story. Yeah, that's that's a great analogy comparing it to the the website. And I was I was twelve, I think. I was born in eighty, so I think I was like a teenager. And teenagers take a different approach to it. Like even with Chat GPT, they they don't wonder how it, how it works. Like they're automatically no. just thinking, I just want to use this. And I think that was the same approach that I had when I was uh, first discovered the internet. I couldn't care less how it worked. I was just like, I can find all kinds of cool things on here. Well, and that's what 12 year olds are great at doing is just, you know, using it. Um, adults, you know, I was, I don't know how old, I was almost 30 by the time uh, uh, the internet showed up. But, you know, I remember being, you know, really puzzled, like, how does this work? Um, you know, I don't know how a car works either, especially in 2024, I've got a basic idea, but I know how to drive. So the internet, artificial intelligence, all of these things, it's the same way. We don't need to worry about how they work, but we do need to understand how do I use this and how does it augment my productivity as a worker? Yeah, well said. So you're an accomplished author, speaker. You got a great website. I've recommended your book, uh, Spiders in Space, a number of times, and I'll leave a link well, to that you. as well. I, I know you've got a new role as well. I, can you share a little bit more yeah. about that too? 
Yeah, so in August of 2023, I uh, took on the role as director of the Energy Transition Center here in Calgary. It is a part-time role for me, which suits my um, my public speaking schedule very nicely. So it's, it's part-time, but the Energy Transition Center is a really interesting space. It is a partnership of the University of Calgary and Innovate Calgary. Innovate Calgary is sort of an arm of the university that helps commercialize some of the really great research that comes out of the university itself. So Innovate Calgary then has partnered with a, 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 a for-profit uh, company called Avatar Innovations. Avatar Innovations goes to the capital markets and finds money to help fund startups in the energy transition. So these might be um, uh, groups that have a really great idea for reducing carbon emissions. It might be a, a green energy like a wind or solar or geothermal, or it might be a clean technology where we can apply some new uh, ideas and new innovations in our traditional oil and gas sector to dramatically bring down or eliminate carbon emissions. So it's a partnership of these two. It really is an incubator space. We like to think of it as a collision space. We've got, I'm here at the Energy Transition Center today, a whole floor of these startups. Um, most of them, they've got not much more than a really great idea so that they're, they're at the really entry level. They don't have clients yet. They don't have a proven technology. They are at, you know, zero on the scale of one to, to nine until they're a successfully commercial operation. But we believe that, uh, you know, providing a little bit of funding, providing some office space, providing some collision space for these uh, bright entrepreneurs, um, that eventually enough of them are going to work and turn into commercially successful enterprises and are going to move the needle even more in helping Canada be a leader in the energy transition. So here we don't talk about eliminating oil and gas. We talk about adding to oil and gas and turning oil and our traditional oil and gas into a more net zero carbon emitting industry. And in that way, being part of the solution. Um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, Canada has every opportunity. And in fact, I would say a responsibility to be leading the world in the transition. Uh, I don't think we have any right in sort of dragging our heels and saying, well, you know, until this country does it or that country. And I get those arguments, but I think fundamentally, Canada, we've got a responsibility to lead the world. And there is no shortage of bright ideas and bright minds in this country. And that really is what the Energy Transition Center is all about. Very cool. I'll leave a link uh, to that as well. If there's anybody in Calgary tuned in and they're just curious about it, I'll put a link yeah. on the show notes. Uh, and then I'll put a link to your website, totters.com. And then are yeah. you are you still active on Twitter or X now or are you more on LinkedIn? You know, <laughs> I haven't deleted my X account, um, but I, I have to confess, I've sort of left it as a space where I would, you know, four years ago, that was my space. Twitter mm -hmm. was where I lived and breathed and I've got, I don't know, 35,000 followers. These days, I've, I've really had to sort of refocus and reevaluate social media. And now LinkedIn is is my predominant area. I use my X account only really to point to something I've put on LinkedIn. I'm just sort of over all the negativity and all the, you know, I think everyone gets it. Um, for whatever reason, Twitter and now X has, has just become this repository of, of nastiness and, and I'm over it. So I still have my account there. If people want to follow me on X, they're really just going to see some things pointing back to my LinkedIn, which I find at least for now is much more um, positive and just much more sort of oriented towards around um, businesses, entrepreneurs and ideas and not so much around divisive opinion. Yeah, that summarizes Twitter quite neatly. That is pretty much exactly what it is. Yeah, and it's uh, too bad too. You know, it's it's really too bad, but that's just the way it's evolved. 
Yeah, and and it, it, I'm sure it will continue evolving. And it's social media is also still in its infancy in the grand yeah, scheme of sure. communication. So I, I'm sure we'll yeah. see further evolutions and changes. And that that will be a wild ride to just watch that unfold. If there even will be a Facebook and a Twitter and a LinkedIn in 20 years, I I don't think anyone can make make that call right now. And Instagram, I do use really just to post pictures of my dogs or my orchids or, you know, just kind of fun personal things. I don't really do too much um, professionally on Instagram, but I do have a presence on Instagram that I just kind of use for for fun. If you can shoot me that, I'll, I'll include that as well, just in case, because people do always appreciate seeing the other side yeah. of someone as opposed to just business all the time. So I'll, I'll put LinkedIn yeah, yeah. And, and Instagram on there. Yeah. And I do like to, you know, show that I do have a personal side too, that I'm a, hopefully people find me a fun and interesting person. So that's really more what the Instagram is about. So I'll send that link too. That'd be great. And and having spoken with you numerous times now, I, I can vouch for that, that you are a great person, both in business and your insights as well as, as personally. So I, I'm a huge fan of yours and I'm very grateful that you keep accepting my invitation for an interview. <laughs> Well, that is very kind of you to say, Chad, and thank you every time. Uh, it's always an honor being on on your podcast, and I hope we can do it again uh, soon in, in 2024. I would love to reach back out perhaps after summer, and we'll get a better idea of the fall going into the election, and I'm sure it'll be a lot of craziness to talk about there. So uh, I'll reach out to you after summer, and we'll see if we can tee up another time. That sounds great. And in 2024, I just urge you and, and all the listeners and viewers, you know, let's be kind to each other. Let's not get too consumed with some of the negative stuff that I think we're going to see in 2024, maybe especially around the U.S. election. Let's not get too anxious. Let's remember that uh, we're all here to support each other and help each other and to be kind. Those are great closing words. Thank you so much once again, Todd. Thanks, Chad.